Building a home lab is all about core gear, servers, storage, and networking. But sometimes it's the little add-ons that make the biggest difference. There are a handful of accessories that don't always get talked about, but once you add them to your setup, they can completely change the way you use your home lab, making it easier to manage, more performant, or even more flexible. In this video, I'll share five accessories that can drastically improve your home lab experience. The first is a good KVM. I stress good because a few years ago, I built a Pi KVM out of a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W that truthfully works really, really well, but it's not portable and has given me a fair share of problems based on how it's powered. Overall, if you have all of the hardware, I would recommend setting one of these up because they can be helpful. But if you don't, you're probably better off buying a dedicated KVM. I held off on just about all KVMs because they all had the same problem for me, which was power. But GLINet recently released the Comet PoE KVM, which is exactly what I wanted. Rather than powering the device through a USB cable, I can power it through PoE with one of my switches, and then it just works as a normal KVM. If you've never used a KVM, this allows you to remotely manage a server or NAS device that runs headless without a keyboard, mouse, or monitor. Basically, you just plug the KVM directly into the device, ensure that you're connecting it to its video output source, and a USB cable so you can use your keyboard and mouse, and then it allows you to do everything online. The software GLINet uses is a wrapper on top of Pi KVM, so I have the same but more reliable performance, and finally don't have to mess around with my old KVM that was fragile from the ribbon that can break and difficult to power just to access my systems. If you've never used a KVM, I think that just about everyone should have one, especially if you run servers headless. If you haven't needed one yet, there will come a time when you do, and having one of these will make it much easier to access and control your servers. Plus, they're not super expensive. So while I prefer the PoE version, there are others that you can buy as well that can be powered by a USB cable. The next is some sort of a multimedia converter, and I wanna be clear up front that not everyone will need or even benefit from one of these. If you've heard of these, you'll probably know of them as Mocha adapters. I have a Unify one that I used in certain situations, but quite honestly, any of them will work. These basically will convert a coaxial cable into an ethernet cable. I wanna stress that that's not exactly the case, but that's a good way of thinking about it. If you have coaxial cables running through your house, technically, you can purchase a Mocha adapter, then connect an ethernet cable from your switch directly to one of the Mocha adapters, then connect the coaxial cable to it, and on the other end, add the second adapter that will then convert the coaxial cable back into ethernet. If you don't have wired ethernet in your house, this is a great way to utilize some of that cable that you might not currently be using for a reliable wired ethernet connection. The performance is generally good up to two and a half gig, and a wired connection will always beat out a wired connection. So check these out if your house isn't hardwired, but does have coaxial cable because you might be able to utilize it. The next is going to be fairly niche, but ever since I started using one, it's hard for me to travel without it, and it's a travel router. I am currently using the Slate 7 from GLINet, but the idea behind it is that rather than having to connect all of your devices to a hotel's Wi-Fi, you connect the router to the Wi-Fi connection using the repeater functionality, and then all of your devices can connect to your travel router. In essence, you're adding a router behind a router, but rather than connecting to the hotel's Wi-Fi, you're connecting directly to your own router with its own SSID. There's also additional protections you can add for the travel router, like AdGuard Home for ad blocking, or a client VPN to route all of your traffic through a VPN for privacy purposes. Overall, I really just like the fact that you're configuring one device that's able to do multiple things, but it's hard to go back after using one. Get to a hotel, connect the GLINet travel router to the Wi-Fi connection, all of your devices can then connect and you're good to go. And I keep saying Wi-Fi connection, but if it has a wired ethernet connection, that works too. The next has a very large range of devices, 
but you can generally find one that can do exactly what you're looking for. And I'm gonna include both Raspberry Pi devices and mini PCs in this category. Now in general, Raspberry Pi devices were super popular many years ago, and that popularity has slowly faded due to mini PCs. Don't get me wrong, they're still super popular, but they're not the only option for small form factor devices like they were for a while. In general, these devices aren't drastically different in price, which is why many people opt for mini PCs these days, as they're x86 based, significantly more powerful, and in general, are capable of doing more for a similar price. With that said, there are still a lot of great uses for Raspberry Pi devices. I'm currently using one for network UPS tools to monitor my UPS devices. I even monitor my generator with one, and you can still very easily configure a VPN server with Pi VPN, or use one for Pi Hole and Unbound. Honestly, the projects are kind of limitless. The main point I wanna make is that they still have their place in the home lab. But for just about everything else where Raspberry Pis aren't great options, mini PCs exist. Now, mini PCs can be as cheap as $100 or as expensive as thousands of dollars. So there's a very wide range of them, but they can do so much. I've used GMK tech devices with Proxmox to configure a mini PC Proxmox cluster. I've used the same devices to configure GPU transcoding for Plex or Jellyfin, and even used a B-Link Mi Mini with TrueNAS as a mini NAS. These aren't the most powerful devices, though some of them can be. They're just generally very flexible and allow you to do various things with them. If you're comparing these options, my suggestion would be to figure out exactly what you want to do with one of them and then work your way back to figure out which device is best as there's a lot of them. I will leave a few links in the description to devices I've used and like, but again, there's a huge range of them. So one might be better than others, depending on what you're trying to do. The final item isn't the most exciting option, but it is the most important item in this list, and it's a UPS, which stands for Uninterruptible Power Source. I consult part-time and work with a lot of home users and small businesses that have servers and NAS devices. The amount of home users and even businesses that don't have a UPS is shocking. A good UPS provides two things, surge protection and battery backup. At a minimum, it should give you enough time to safely shut down a device or multiple devices, assuming you buy a large enough UPS. In a best case scenario, it will last for an entire power outage and none of your services will go down. The point is that for something like a NAS device, I'd say that it's mandatory for data integrity purposes. When you start messing with unexpected power outages, which cause unexpected shutdowns and you're utilizing RAID, you can lose data and it's simply not worth it. They have various sizes and there are tons of different types. You can buy one that comes with a USB cable so that a device can monitor the UPS, like I'm currently doing with my NUT server. If you just want a small one for something like your router, you can buy one that doesn't have a USB cable, but keep in mind, you won't be able to automatically shut down your devices if you buy one and it does not have a USB cable as that's how the device is able to monitor the UPS. The key here is having something and there are various sizes and various price ranges that will all work in one way or another. In my opinion, I'd say that you should use one for your NAS devices and servers too. When you start getting into things like network switches and stuff like that, I prefer to have them on a UPS, but I wouldn't exactly say it's necessary. With that said, if you're using something like security cameras and those security cameras are running through one of your network switches, a UPS will keep them online during a power outage. In that specific scenario, that is one situation where having your network switches on a UPS can be very helpful. If you're not in that situation, as long as the network switches are on a good surge protector, you should be okay. But overall, almost everyone needs at least one UPS. And if you've been holding off on buying one, don't. It's a great insurance policy to have. And for most people, it will be needed at some point. Now, there are other items that I'm sure I missed, and I'd love to hear what you think in the comments. There are a lot of accessories out there, and I'd love to add some helpful items to my home lab too. I hope you got some value out of this video. I have affiliate links in the description for some of these items. If you use the link, I'll earn a small commission at no cost to you. So thank you for your support. But other than that, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.